Thank you so much, Letty. And thank you to all of you for having me today. It's such an honor. Uh, if you would have asked me 15 years ago if I ever would have found myself being honored at any luncheon that had the word Jewish in it, I would have been quite surprised. Um, <laughs> I was actually raised singing in the church choir, the daughter of an interfaith family. My mother actually comes from seven generations of United Church of Christ ministers and missionaries. So when I decided to go on a birthright trip my junior year at Penn, you could say my family was a little surprised. Um, but the trip was free, and I was studying international relations, and I'd never left the East Coast. So I needed a little street cred in my major, didn't want to be in New Jersey over winter break, so Israel, why not? Um, I wish I could tell you I went with this deep sense of longing and purpose, wanting a connectivity to a people and a tradition, but I really just didn't want to be in New Jersey. <laughs> so I, I, I got on the plane, seated alphabetically with all the other Cohens, and introduced myself to the nine rows of Cohens, and, and then, we, then we landed in Israel, and, and I had not even a glimmer of the intense indelible impression that country would make on me. It was the first time I'd ever seen real poverty. I'd seen real religious conflict. I'd ever seen real love of a land. Uh, we wave our flags in this country, but the soldiers that I met there were spending every day and putting their life on the line for, for their ability to have a country. And those 10 days changed my life forever and transformed the way I see myself as sister, daughter, granddaughter, and even as citizen of the world. I came back and was committed to using my life in service of others, of finding the stories that I'd found in Israel and finding more and sharing those stories with the world. And I knew that if my generation heard about issues that people were tackling in other countries, about stories of people our own age who were losing their lives or didn't have equal rights, they would want to stand up and they would want to do something about it. So birthright, I guess you could say, is where all the trouble began, <laughs> at least my Jewish trouble. If my mother was here, she'd say there was a lot of trouble before I turned 20 also. Um, I'd say my first instance of Jewish trouble that I made, I, I came back from birthright at Penn and went straight to, to services to try to celebrate Shabbat. I showed up on the, on the first Friday, and it was, it was actually a, a novel thing. You can ask my husband. I've never done this since or before, but I showed up early for Shabbat. Uh, I, I had a new dress. I was in the front row and I sat there and when I got to my seat there was there was a book on the chair and in church that's your hymnal. You put it under your chair on the floor until they call out the number of the hymn. Apparently that's not what you do at Shabbat. <laughs> so five minutes into the service people ran up to me and picked up the book and started kissing it and put it in my face and made me kiss it and look I know Jews love books but <laughs> this was strange. <laughs> So, so I immediately got up and left and decided I was going to be a Jew who didn't go to services, come to find out that's not so foreign. <laughs> so a few years later, I realized I wanted to actually explore this whole religion thing, and I was going back to services, and then that's where the trouble started. Um, I decided I wasn't going back alone that time, so I put up a little ad saying, we're going to host a Shabbat Hoppin experience come to this service at this time if you don't know anything about anything Jewish and you'd like to learn. And I marched into that Shabbat in 2007 in February with 75 people who knew nothing, just like me. And when it came time to explain the prayers, I raised my hand and said, can you tell us why we say that? And this time, no one made me kiss a book. So that was my first Jewish trouble. I got into lots of other trouble, too, though, that Israel started. Uh, the kind of trouble that's really the best kind I realized that there was this big, bad, beautiful world out there, but not enough people in my generation knew the stories of what was going on in that world. So whether it was people who didn't have religious freedom or they were suffering from gender or race persecutions, I wanted the people in my generation to know about them. And first I went to work for Nancy Rubin, who you heard about, an incredible former ambassador to the UN. And by working with her, I learned that the best ideas are not always the ones that are the best articulated or that are said by the person with the most senior experience in the room. The best ideas are the ones that are shared because all your ideas that die with you really didn't do anybody any good. Uh, another personal hero of mine I went to work for was Lynn Schusterman, who taught me because she's my height, excuse me, because she's my height, 
Lynn taught me that little people can still make really big change. <laughs> uh, and then I realized that I could use my voice. I'd known that when I was younger. I actually, at 13, sang at Lincoln Center. And when I was 15, I was at Cox for a huge crew team. But I never used my voice for change. I just used it for attention. You can do both. <laughs> so I decided to use my voice in a bigger way to get these stories from around the world to my generation so they could get angry, get inspired, and act up. And in 2011, I founded the Nexus Global Youth Summit on Innovative Philanthropy and Social Entrepreneurship. Side note, would someone tell me how to make an acronym for that? <laughs> you Jews are good at that, right? Um, what we do at Nexus is we gather people of my generation from 75 countries. They're philanthropists worth $100 billion collectively, not individually. Uh, and they're social entrepreneurs making change. And I bring them together to hear the stories, the stories of the young people that need to be told. In the past two years, I visited 18 different countries. Russia, Israel, Greece, Liberia, Kenya, Rwanda, Colombia, Ecuador, countries where you don't necessarily want passport stamps from. But I listen and I sit with people and I ask them, what would you do if you could change your country? And then I come to Nexus and I tell people, that's what the community said they need. How can we get that to them? So in Nexus, we make a lot of trouble. We've got thousands of young people making trouble. We stormed the, two, the UN two years ago and told the Secretary General, these are the issues that young people care about. And not, are we, not only are we storming the UN and storming the streets, but we're taking to the internet superhighways and using our social media currency to try to make a difference. Tweeting can make a difference. And there's a new website called Thunderclap that makes an even bigger difference. But when I was told I was going to be honored, by the Jewish Women's Archive, they asked me to talk about feminism and to talk about millennial feminism. And I wasn't sure that I could, because for my generation, the word feminist kind of has an allergic reaction for people. It sounds like feminist, communist, socialist, one of those big views you have to subscribe to with blinders on. But feminist, it could mean that. But for me, it could also mean something rather magical. To me, feminists are like superheroes. They, they took care of Gotham in an age when there were bad guys out there with, with gender restrictions and no ability to vote and where you hit glass ceilings everywhere you went. Those superheroes shadowed those glass ceilings and they gave us rights so that I can be a feminist today just in the way I live my life. When I take birth control, when I vote, when I demand a raise or equal pay and get it, I'm a feminist just in the way I live my life. But also, every great superhero has a great super belt or toolkit. And the feminists who came before me gave me a really beautiful superhero magnifying glass. And I carry that wherever I go. And every issue I look at, whether it's ending poverty or how the UN works, or even reading an op-ed in the New York Times, I take that magnifying glass, and it's the gender lens through which I read everything. I analyze everything. Gender is a part of the way that I think about the world in a daily basis. And that's because of those superhero feminists who did it before me and who broke down doors that I can now walk in very, very easily. So really today, I'm just here to say thank you, even though I'm the one getting the award. I couldn't be in any of the rooms that I'm in, stirring up any of the trouble that I do if there weren't feminists before me to knock down those doors. I'm standing on your shoulders, and I'm inspiring a generation to do the same, but only because I didn't have to waste my time and spend so much time fighting for the right to know that I had a voice and for a podium to be able to speak from. So thank you all for giving me that choice. Thank you all for giving me so many freedoms. And I would only tell you that if you're worried about our generation in any way, if you think that we're not as, as spirited or as aware or that, or that we might be apathetic to global issues, we're not. We're doing it in different ways, but we're standing up and we're carrying your torch and we won't let it down.